It's Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Ha! Feedback Friday. Now, if you hear a strange sound during this Feedback Friday that sounds kind of a combination between a Wookiee and an angry swarm of bees, it's Momo back here snoring. <laughs> It's a very strange sound. He stopped right now. You see Midna on the top bunk and Momo on the lower bunk. And Momo tends to snore quite loudly. Um, so if you hear a sound like I described, that's what it is. It's not an audio problem. It's not. So, it's Momo snoring. It's the strangest sound, but it's kind of adorable. And um, YouTube demonetized my video on Wednesday. And as you can tell with the two video lead up I did to it. I had a sense it was coming, but it's still very frustrating because I don't think compassion should be demonetized, but YouTube gonna YouTube. So you know what's coming. Patreon, Patreon, you should become a member. Patreon, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Um, your Patreon support, your, your Twitch stuff, all that stuff. Um, allows me to do this stuff on YouTube that doesn't make any money because they demonetize it or because the traffic's not so good because I'm not gaming the algorithm. But sometimes I just feel like it's very, very necessary. I really do believe that it's not, I shouldn't say it's not just about making money because it is a business, but I think that forming a longer term um, relationship and a, a longer term um, uh, dialogue with with an audience with a group of supporters is very important. One because then then people feel like it's not just transactional that somebody out there gives a damn. Um, but the other is uh, the fact that when you know I do misword something or when something comes out the wrong way. I've earned benefit of doubt and I, I, you know, I totally think it's fair to build that sort of relationship so that if something comes out the wrong way, you guys know, or, or if something can be interpreted multiple ways, you guys, guys being a gender neutral term, know that that's not how I meant it. I think that's really important. Um, and I kind of don't know where to go with Feedback Friday this week because the conversation like went out in like 10 different directions, all really equally valid and I can't do all 10 and I don't know how to pick. So I'm just going to start talking and see where it goes and I'll cut myself off after a certain period of time. Um, the, I, I think from a healing perspective, I think this week's videos were worth doing. Simply because people who needed to feel heard felt heard. People who needed to be seen felt seen. People who needed to be understood at least felt partially understood. And uh, that came up, that came up against this idea of validation and healing and how does someone get validation and healing when there's no systems to allow them that. And I, I talked about this briefly, I think, a, a few times, but the idea of um, retributive justice, meaning seeking retribution for justice, I was harmed, therefore you must be punished, and restorative justice, something that makes the, the person who was wronged feel whole again. I'm a much bigger believer in that latter one. Um, and it's... It's actually in, in some ways easier to do and in some ways a lot harder to do. It's not always possible. I, I do think long term it's better than this series of punishments. Um, what's odd is that even after I made these videos, people who hadn't seen them started telling me other stories about how they just felt like completely taken advantage of. They felt completely helpless. Um... So I'm going to speak a bit more on that just based on my own circumstances. Um, in our incredibly interconnected world, walking away 
from a toxic group of people doesn't seem doable a lot of the time. I know that, but it is. Um, one of the things I make sure I do is that I do have some friends that don't spend their lives online. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who are very technical people, but I also have a, a lot of friends who are writers, and so they don't spend a lot of time online. They're not wired that way. Um, they're real life people. And so, you know, having their perspectives, knowing nothing about what's going on online is, um, is very useful. Um, the issue with gaming is millions of people game. In some ways, it's this very big community, but there are only so many common gathering points, right? We're either in these tiny little groups or on our own, or in these huge things like um, PAX or um, E3 or, you know, E3 less and less because it's not a gathering place anymore. People watch it online. But there are these places that you kind of feel like you should be and you feel like you're really damaging your uh, career or your ability to network if you're not there. Um, what I found dipping my toe back into those environments is they are good places to make contacts. Maybe, if you get lucky. They're not essential. There's, there's other ways. I mean, there's... There's no substitute for face-to-face -face contact. I do think we need more um, professional gatherings that aren't GDC just because San Francisco is prohibitively expensive now for Canadians to go. Like, like San Francisco is a very expensive city to begin with and with the exchange rate, like $700 a night for a hotel room is just not happening. Um, and... You know, so there's, and, and you can't, you know, people like, oh, do Air, Airbnb, do all this stuff. I tried the Airbnb thing. You get no sleep because there's too many people in a shared sound environment. Um, you keep getting woken up because people are coming and going. And then, you know, you end up getting sick. You're, I'm still exhausted. I have not felt rested. Now, granted, there's been a lot of other things going on, but I have not felt rested since PAX. Um, and no one in any other field, I was not this tired when I did TV conferences with all this toxic energy that was going around them because at TV conferences, people recognize you have to eat, you have to sleep for an extent. Like this is a job. This isn't party time. This isn't spring break with no sun. You know, it's not nerd prom. This is a job. And the parties are fun, but there's a way to do it responsibly and not get sick. You need a place to go back to that is your space. And I, I think that idea of, of your space, that that being okay to ask for, is it's becoming an increasingly difficult thing. I see it in people who are younger than me. And, you know, I've been, I've been talking to people lately who just feel excommunicated. And, you know, I admit I had a lot of anxiety going into PAX because of how I was defamed during the whole Gamergate controversy uh, and, and with things like popping up the way, the way they did, like certain people popping back up on the radar first day of PAX, I was like, oh God, um... And I, I do still feel like to some extent I am an easy target for people to attack. I am acceptable to shun. I am only partially a human being. I still don't really believe I get a fair shot based on my ideas in this industry uh, with the online stuff. And I see it because I get a much better reception in academic institutions than I do from, from the games press. Now, long-term, I don't have a big problem with that because I really do believe that the current paradigm in gaming needs a lot of fixing. And so 
I believe I'm going to be in a better space when, as always happens, this current guard kind of be either either gets wiped away or or becomes increasingly irrelevant, or, um, y- you know, there's just a big sea change or someone takes a takes a, a, a give me gives me a chance properly markets and really shows that a an inclusive um supportive environment for everyone is possible now when we do that big tent we do have issues like unfortunately the current paradigm forces us to get into camps uh, mostly around words like we get stuck in these semantics things and again please i i this sounds really arrogant, but it's not because it's not me doing this. It's the people in the Twitch chats when I do Twitch streams. We had a whole discussion about um, game mechanics involving succubi, you know, the succubus, the, the monster, that I don't know how it it happened, but we got into Randian philosophy, like Ayn Rand. And... The, I I forget. Oh, it was based on the Joker movie. That's right. And and uh, and if you want to see my thoughts on the Joker movie, it's a patron only video because I don't do reviews like that anymore. They don't get enough traffic, uh, and it doesn't help anybody really. So I keep them for patrons only. But it was a fascinating conversation, um, and it it never really resolved anywhere. It was just a sharing of ideas. Which is what I always considered conversations to be. You know, before I saw the movie, um, I, I got together with three friends, two of which came to the movie with me. Um, one, um, one who had seen it already but just came for dinner. And it was a really great discussion. And it was people who were from very different walks of life, but it was, everybody was very smart. Everybody was very kind. And it was a really good discussion. And by the end, I said, we should do this again. This is like a really good conversation. And I really think that that's what the, this cancel culture paradigm is preventing. This idea of great conversation. Because what happens is you have a debate, not a dialogue, not a conversation, but you have a debate me thing. And no matter what anybody says, the the faction that one person is represented by is going to agree with them and disagree with the other side and vice versa. And then there's just this massive online clash. And so nobody really wants to engage. They may be curious, but they will not discuss the original debate because everybody's fighting. And that is anti-intellectual it is anti-community it is impossible to really get anything done in that way because everybody's fighting and you know I've, I've talked to some people who do inclusivity for a, a, a living and what they say is fascinating it's been it's been consistent with every professional I've talked to they said they they actually have to have to get staffs um in the, in the idea, you have to get enough trust within your staff of, look, we're going to do this one thing for this group this way, this time. And we're all going to be on board with that. So then we can move on to another group of people. And we're going to do something for them. And we all have to be on board with that. And then, you know, and sometimes things can happen at the same time. Sometimes it just has to wait a bit. And sometimes it's about priority, like we need to stop the bleeding in this area now. Sometimes it's just, we can get this done now because it's a simpler problem. And the issue is with the stuff that goes online, people want attention now and they want satisfaction now and they're not prepared to wait. They're not prepared to um, let someone else's um, issue take priority for now. I think because they've spent their life being overlooked. And maybe this was in my head. I had a very weird experience going down on the subway to see the Joker movie. And I think that I'm glad this happened before the movie. For those of you who know what happens in the movie. Um, instead of 
after because it would have been framed very differently in my head if it had been after. This is what makes it so bizarre. This happens to me like things just it's like life is trying to teach me a lesson somehow. I was on the subway writing when I have to take the the train or when I have to take the subway, I take a notebook and I do a uh, boss fight dialogue. And so it was, it was so funny. Um, uh, because I was, I was sitting next to this guy and I was writing the, the gamer identities inherently male episode. And so I was writing the boss of that episode, writing like vaguely racist stuff. And I realized a black guy was sitting next to me and I'm like, wow, I hope he doesn't look over at this notebook. So I actually switched and started writing a uh, princess sparkle muffin and, and the sparkle pets dialogue instead, just in case. Cause I didn't want the guy to make me, be, I didn't want the guy to be uncomfortable. Um, but then this guy, um, disheveled white guy with dreadlocks, brown coat, fairly tall, um, talking to himself, yelling at himself, you know, of course, because it's the Toronto subway, the guy starts ranting about sluts and whores. And I'm like, oh God. But of course, guys like that, they rant about that stuff, but they don't, they don't go after women. They pick fights with other men. Um, and I saw him going for this brown kid. Um, could have been Muslim. Could have been like, I don't know, from from uh, South or Central America, from Mexico, something like that. Hard to tell from a distance, but of course this guy zeroes in on this brown kid. And by kid, I mean it's hard to tell. He could have been as young as 18. He could have been as old as 24. So like, and he was half this yelling man's size. Like he came up to like the guys here, maybe. Young kid, like really fresh faced. Uh, he could have been younger. It's hard to tell these days for me. But um, to me, anybody under 30 is a kid, to be clear. But this guy gets up in this kid's face and he yells, this guy just said he rapes men and started dropping some terms that I'm not going to say because YouTube is going to demonetize the video. Um, and then this guy started announcing because the kid moved to a door trying to get away from this guy. And he had that smile on his face, which is if I keep smiling, hopefully this guy will stop and go away. But of course he didn't. And he announced to the whole train that he was going to get off at the next stop and kick the guy's ass, the kid, for doing nothing because he was the focus of whatever delusion this guy was in the middle of at this point. And I don't excuse this guy's behavior based on delusion because plenty of people are mentally ill and don't do this crap. Um, and so this, this is where things got not stereotypical and kind of interesting. Um, this guy, he was about the same height as the guy who was being a menace, bald guy, white guy, yells, leave him alone. And the the, the menacing dude pretty much totally ignored him. It's like that egged him on. Like he got louder about he was going to kick his ass. And this other guy keeps yelling, leave him alone. It was escalating the situation. And I'm like, when the guy first started yelling, it was scary. But when I saw him picking on another guy, I got mad. And... All I kept thinking is, this is not happening. This is not happening to this guy. This is no way. And I was glaring at the guy. And the next thing I know, this guy goes, you gonna stop me? And I took me a few seconds to realize he was talking to me. Because I didn't realize I was half on my feet glaring daggers at this guy. I think I was half on my feet partially because I was prepared to hit the emergency button if he did take a swing at this kid. But I just kept glaring at this guy and glaring at this guy and just wouldn't back down. And I watched him wilt. I saw fear in this guy's eyes. I don't think the guy was used to someone not taking the bait, but not backing down. 
And I can't help but think it was probably more intimidating for the guy because he wasn't used to women in public places taking him on. It's not the typical gender role, right? Like men are expected to white knight that way. Women aren't. And this is part of the point. I don't play that game. I don't think anybody should sit by and let someone be menaced just because they're male. The guy was barely an adult. He was half the guy's size. He was smaller physically than me. It's not fair. And like none of us are going to fight this guy. The point is to prevent violence. And so the guy withers. Like, I, I was really surprised, but it's like, and I think he knew I knew he was scared. And so that backed him off. So he did get off at the same stop as, as the brown kid. But he didn't go after the kid. Of course, I like followed to see. I was this close to hitting the emergency button. And then I saw this asshole, like, go, he left the, he left the car, the subway, went back in the other car. And the thing about our subway cars is you can see right down them. So he could have just like walked away that way. But no, he was, he was hiding. He tucked his tail and run. And I just said like, he just got back on the car. And everybody who of course had been looking at this whole thing, turned around and kind of shook their heads and started laughing. And this guy went from being this menacing, stereotypical bad guy, right? To an object of pity to someone who just, wow, isn't that guy pathetic? And then, of course, I had that moment of, you know, wow, that was really stupid. What was I doing? But that was because at that point, I wasn't identifying as as female, right? I was identifying as a person who does not just sit there and let other people eat crap while I sit there and do nothing. It, it you know, those, those gender norms didn't come into it because to me, that is equality. We do not have a world that is equal if expectations in situations like that are different for women than they are for men. Everybody is totally capable of standing up to bullies. We may have to do it in different ways, but we are all capable of doing that. And, you know, what was the guy going to do? Hit me? Right. That, the, the truth is that, I meant this kind of go over the head, if the guy hits me, something's actually going to happen to him. If it hits the other kid, that, that kid, because he's male, might not even press charges. And I was just so angry that someone used an excuse and, you know, mental illness is a real thing, but I know plenty of people, there's no reason in Canada to not get help. It may take a while and it's hard, but there's no excuse to be that far gone. I have friends of mine who have been, now in the U.S. is different, right? In the U.S. you guys don't have the same kind of health care and stuff like that. In our country, no excuse. It's hard, but there's no excuse. You shouldn't be a menace to other people. And that to me is what we need more of in various online communities. And I get in a lot of crap for doing this. Like those of you who, who follow my content probably aren't surprised by this because I don't know if it's video games. I don't know if it's the neighborhood I grew up in. I it could be just a combination of factors, but I do not let this stuff just happen. You know, when I was a kid, this happened too. Um, I, I stood up for kids who didn't have anybody to stand up for them. And I really think that all communities hit a critical mass where, you know, maybe, hey, leave them alone isn't the right tactic at a given time. Maybe staring someone down is. But that's the only way to get toxicity out of a community, to keep trying. Because if they, like, if they keep throwing us out, then eventually those of us on the outside are going to outnumber this in-group, which means they have no power anymore. And I really do think that's what's happening in gaming and in culture. There's, you know, as I'm recording this, they're doing Elijah Cummings Memorial down in the U.S. and Mark Meadows, who's 
the head of the Freedom Caucus, staunch Republican caucus, right? He was Elijah Cummings' friend. And Elijah Cummings' like tagline was, we're better than this. You know, this guy, this Elijah Cummings was a guy who had every reason to treat a guy like Mark Meadows as just a completely different species of being. But clearly he didn't. And that's a real example for both of them, right? Because obviously Mark Meadows wasn't such a, you know, treated Elijah Cummings with respect to. And I really do think we have to get back to that idea of respect because respect is what's left when you don't like someone, when someone's annoying you. And respect is the only way we come back from disagreement. If you dehumanize someone, it's not about the original issue anymore. It's about that. It's about the fact that you went too far and you dehumanize someone and now you have two problems to solve. The original issue, which, you know, you may have had a valid point there, but the minute you dehumanize someone, disagreeing with somebody doesn't give you that right. And so things get messier and messier and messier. And it's been very validating and val- I don't know. I think it's more like it's just a reason to keep going because it's such a slog. It's so, you know, the constant YouTube demonetization, the fact that, you know, this week has been shedding of subscribers because YouTube is deleting accounts that are supposedly, you know, inactive and stuff like that. So all that stuff's really depressing, like constantly struggling, not knowing month to month how much money is actually going to come in. All that stuff is is hard. But seeing the progression in certain commenters, especially the ones that I was very close to blocking in in parts, because some regular, they came in so angry. And I've watched the change. I've watched the gradual lowering of the guard and being more open to to dialogue, to not communicating that way. And that, I don't see that as about me. I see that as a reward I gave myself, giving that person a chance to trust. And I don't think that makes me right. I don't think that makes me a quote unquote good person. I think that that was a reward to see that change that gives me hope. That was a reward for giving another person a chance to show their goodness. So that's about that other person. That's about that other person having a, a, a goodness of spirit, a goodness of heart that overcame their anger. And that's very hard to do. It's very hard to start from a place of distrust and eventually work up a relationship where there can be communication. And yes, that takes a certain amount of strength on my part. I I don't block unless there's disrespect, unless like I tell somebody to knock something off, give them all. You guys have seen it. You guys have seen it on, on, on Twitch. Like one more time, buddy. One more time. All right. Goodbye. But it's never on the first. It's never on the first offense. Never. I don't believe in that. And I do think, I do think there's a a lot of good people watching this right now who have not been treated like good people. And there's no identifier attached to this. You know, there was an interesting conversation in comments about one trans person told me to stop using the word cis as a trans person that can't stand it. And then another trans person came in and said, I don't see anything wrong with having a word uh, for people whose um, biological gender matches their biological sex matches the gender they identify with because it's not they're normal and I'm not. So, you know, that was an example of um, disagreement within the community. There's no right or wrong answer there. It's, it's just different people's perspectives and it's important to know both of them. 
There's an ongoing debate about Latinx. I'm seeing it more and more and more on television shows. It's this American thing that I'm seeing. But my Latin viewers hate it. They think it's a, a diminishment of the language. And so you'll notice I did it earlier. Um, I say South and Central American and Mexican because there are some people in those regions that don't consider themselves Latin. They're, they're indigenous. They're this. Um, many people, like people in Mexico, they're Mexican. It's, it's not... Um, you, you can have like an ethnicity and be Mexican. It's not default Latin. Uh, you notice I say Latin instead of Latinx out of respect to the people who watch this channel that don't like it. And like I know other people who don't like the term people of color. Uh, for many reasons. You know, one, pe one person says, I'm not a crayon. Another person says it's too much of a catch-all term and makes it seem like every, you know, experience is the same when it's not. And, but then there's the problem of there are some people that think if I even utter the word black, I'm racist. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be in a city that allows me to have a very multicultural group of friends. And multicultural might be a better term than people of color because it's culture as well, right? Um, but I am very blessed by these perspectives, including those of atheists. Sorry, that's, that's just a tick, you know? Like, that's my word for feeling fortunate. Um, but not everybody has those experiences. Now, some people, it's because they don't want to. Other people just have not been fortunate enough to be exposed to those other perspectives in a calm way. And I hope if I can do something that I can sort of be a pathway to those experiences without speaking over people. And, you know, that, you know, in this whole culture war identity politics thing, I, th I think that's the biggest takeaway. Just don't speak over people. Don't. You know, I can only talk about my experience. And like I said earlier, I'm really sick of labels because my physical identifiers really give people the wrong idea about me. You know, uh, someone on Twitch was like, where'd you come up with that hip hop symphony metaphor? And this is a guy who's like super schooled in music and he loved it. It's like, OK, good. If he likes it, then. And for me, it was just because of where I grew up. And I took ballet, so I had a lot of exposure to classical music. But I love hip-hop, man. And they're totally different things. Like, when I, when I took advanced French, they finally said you have to stop thinking in English and then translating into French. You have to think in French because of the, the inversions in, in, the, in the verb conjugations. Um... You'll never keep up if you're translating as you go. You have to speak and understand in French to keep up. And it's true. But it's the same thing. In order to keep up, you have to speak hip hop. You have to speak classical music, right? You have to speak opera. You have to speak Broadway. And learning, you know, finding what Carol Channing called the spine of a work is very important. And so when we're talking about games, we have to speak video game. We can't be converting from movies or TV shows or books or anything like that. And if anybody wonders what I teach in schools when I lecture, it's pretty much that. It's trying to get people to look at games as games, not as, um, not as books or movies you play. So that's my takeaway from this week. Next week, I'll go back to the stuff that is is kind of geared towards more traffic. I'm not sure what that's going to be yet. Maybe some looking forward stuff. I don't know. Some stuff I'm looking forward to. Anybody got any ideas? Anybody got any ideas of what to do more of? I'm, I'm kind of lost because I'm just so meh on everything right now. Like, that's part of the problem. I'm having a blast with abduction because I'm playing it with people. It's this really great social thing. Like, it, it was not what I expected Twitch to be at all. It's this cool communal experience. I'm enjoying the game way more than I would playing it myself. Um, 
But what do you guys want to know? What do you guys know know about like gaming, gamer related things? I'm I'm curious. Like I I admit I feel a bit out of touch just because I've been I've got 20 characters in my head right now with boss fight. That's probably part of the problem. But I'm really curious and and you know I got to do this cuz business. Patreon, Patreon. You should become a member. Patreon, patreon.com/lianak. Thank you everybody so much for watching.